Bayesian learning for binary variables. So far we have assumed that the network structure and the um, probabilities are given and we have just done inference. However, there are more levels on which a decision has to be made how to build the network and how to choose the uh, parameters. So first of all, there's a level of structure, so we have to decide for a particular problem how many nodes are there and how they should be connected. Um, secondly, we have to decide on the parameterization of the local probability distributions, so the way we represent the probability distributions. So if it's um, discrete values, then it could be just a table. If it's continuous, we have to decide whether it should be, I don't know, a Gaussian or uh, some spline function that approximates uh, the probability distribution, whatever. Then, once we have decided on a parameterization, let's assume we have, assu uh, we, uh, have taken a Gaussian, then the parameters of these distributions have to be determined, such as the, um, the standard deviation of the Gaussian or the covariance matrix of the Gaussian, that would be level number three. And finally, the fourth level is actually sampling the values uh, of the random variables, so do inference in the network. And so far we were only concerned with number four. Now I want to say something about three, and that works towards learning in Bayesian networks. Right. So ideally you would like to uh, in particular the structure and also values of the parameters, find these based on the problem that you have. And I will talk now about uh, the third case. And I will start with a very simple example of just one binary variable. That's about the simplest thing uh, you can have. So if you have a binary, binary random variable, that means a variable that can assume the values 0 and 1, then I mean the only thing you need to represent is the probability of getting a 0 or a 1. So we take theta as a parameter for the probability of getting a 1. Now so far we have just assumed these values are known and now we will treat these as unknown variables that can be learned or that can be inferred from some data like the values themselves can be inferred from from the network probability distribution. Okay, so theta now is a parameter and not a known constant. If we want to do everything coherently in a Bayesian framework, we treat this as a random variable. Yeah. We use a capital letter for that, for the random variable, and the lowercase letter would be the instantiation of that. Now, if it's, if it's a dis random variable, we need a distribution, so we make an assumption about the a priori distribution of theta and that's indicated by p of theta. For instance, if we have a coin, we don't know the probability um, with which we get heads or tails, but we have some prior, we have some prejudice about it, and this could look like this here. So if this is the value of theta going from 0 to 1, so 0 probability to throw heads and one probability, so 100% sure to throw heads, and would assume that uh, somehow the maximum lies in the center and that it falls off towards uh, 0 and 1. I mean, normally probably one would have a sharper distribution, but anyhow, if you're in a gambling club, maybe you might have more such a prejudice here. So, we can now write the probability of getting heads, right, x equals 1, where 1 indicates heads, 
um, conditioned on the parameter, right? And that probability, of course, is the parameter itself. Right? So the probability of getting heads, given that the probability of, get, get, of getting heads is theta, is of course theta. Yeah, but if theta is not known, but we only have a distribution over theta, that's a different issue. So then we ha would write it like this. So what's the probability of getting heads? If you have some idea about theta, in the form that th theta follows a particular probability density function. In order to calculate that, we have to integrate, because theta is a continuous variable, otherwise we would have to, to sum. We have to integrate over all possible values of theta, from 0 to 1. We weigh this with a probability density that we actually get this parameter, and then we take the probability of getting heads given that particular value of theta. Now, since we know that this actually is theta, as seen here, we can write this integral like this. Yeah, so the probability of getting heads, if we have some distribution over theta, would be this integral here. So now, this would be the probability if you toss the coin just once to get heads. Now if you ca toss it a couple of times, so n times, you can calculate the probability of getting capital H heads and capital T tails. Now let's first consider the probability of getting one particular sequence of heads and tails. So if we ask the probability what's a, for getting heads, tails, heads, heads. Yeah. Can write it like this maybe. That would be, well, we have a probability of getting heads for the first coin, for the first toss, then we have a probability of getting tails for the second toss, etc. And we simply multiply these probabilities. No. And since the probability of getting heads, if theta is known, no, it, we're talking about this situation again and not this situation. So if theta is known, then the probability of heads is simply theta, right? Okay, so I don't have a theta here. Let's take a capital Q that I think is not used and looks somewhat like a theta. Okay, so that would be Q. Then the probability of getting tails is 1 minus Q. Then we have a probability of getting heads and heads again, so that would be Q and Q. Yeah. So that's the probability of getting exactly this sequence. So we can even simplify this further and say that would be q to the power of 3 times 1 minus q to the power of 1. Okay. Now, if we are not interested in a particular sequence, but we simply ask what's the probability of getting three heads and one tail, then we not only have to take into consideration this particular sequence, but there are many more sequences um, with the same with the same this very same probability, right? So that's in this situation is relatively easy to write down. That's a combination we had already. But it is also tail, heads, 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 tail, heads, and heads, 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 tail. So there are exactly four combinations that all have three heads and one tail. And uh, if we if we are not interested in the order, just in the number of heads and tails, then we would have to add the probabilities of these three cases. 
Now, since we, since all these combinations have the same probability, we simply multiply the probability of getting one particular sequence by the uh, by the with a certain number of heads and tails by the number of different sequences that you might have now that you, with a particular number of heads and tails. Now, how how many combinations are there? Well, that's given by this factor. Yeah? So heads plus tails, so h plus t factorial divided by h factorial t factorial. So why is it so? Ah, you simply remember this from uh, from combinatorics, uh, but it's also relatively easy to see why that's the case. Um, so first. I remind you that the factorial is a way to express or to calculate how many permutations you have for one particular set of elements. Right? Since we have a sequence of four elements, h plus t is four, and four factorial would be the total number of permutations that you can make. It's also easy to see. It's four, four position, possible positions for the first symbol, then there are three positions left for the second symbol, two left for the third, one left for the four, so four times three times two times one. Okay, so this gives the total number of permutations that you have for the symbols in the whole sequence. However, if you permute the ages or the t's, that doesn't change the sequence, right? So you have to divide this number of total permutations by the number of permutations within the age symbols and within the t symbols, right? And that gives exactly this expression. Okay, so if we, now we multiply the number of particular sequences with a, with, of possible sequences with a particular number of H's and, and T's with the probability of getting such a sequence and that gives us the total probability of getting capital H heads and capital T tails given theta. Okay, so we started with some prejudice uh, about the distribution of theta. That would be this one here. Yeah. And now how does this change as we toss the coin and we get additional information? This is illustrated further down. So let's assume we toss the coin in this case 16 times or 46 times and we always get a ratio of uh, 3 quarter of a heads and 1 quarter tails. This is obviously a biased coin and the evidence of our tosses indicates that actually we have a 3 quarter probability of getting heads. Yeah? So by tossing the coin more and more we learn that the distribution of theta is not unbiased and centered around 50%, but it sort of moves towards the three-quarter that we get empirically. Right? So we have a prior, we have a prejudice, and we correct our prejudice by the evidence that we gather. And the more evidence we have, the more we correct our prejudice, and we, the more certain we are about the true value of our theta value. So that's the intuition. So how does this work uh, more formally? Well, we ask for the probability distribution of theta given our prior distribution and the new evidence H and T. Now formally we can use Bayes rule to calculate that, right? So that would be just p of ht given theta and p of theta, p of theta given p theta and p of ht given p theta, right? So p theta is on the right side of all these terms and the rest is just Bayes rule. Okay, from here to there we eliminate this p of theta 
because p of theta doesn't give us any in useful information if we know exactly the value of theta. Yeah, so we can drop p of theta there. Then we can realize that this one here simply is p theta, right? So the probability of theta given p theta is simply p theta, right? So we drop theta here for this term. Okay, so let's look at uh, equation 144. That's probably the easiest to explain this. So we have calculated the probability of getting one heads given the distribution, and that's the integral over theta of the probability of getting heads given a particular value weighted with the probability density of that value. Right? And this is exactly what we do down here to get from here to there, right? We write this integral. Okay, and then we have calculated further up um, the probability of getting heads and tails given theta, and that has this, uh, and maybe I also go back for that, that's the easiest. That is this equation, right? So probability for heads and tails given theta is simply this prefactor times theta to the power of h times 1 minus theta to the power of t. And this prefactor in this fraction cancels out. Now because we have the same term here and here, the, we have the same prefactor that cancels, so we are left with this part. So, and this is sort of expresses in a very clear, formal way how the probability distribution of theta changes as we gather evidence in terms of tosses uh, with h heads and t tails. Once we have that, we can now calculate the probability of tossing heads the next time giving that evidence. Right, that would be p of heads given we have tossed already h heads and t tails and our prior distribution. Yeah. So that's again simply this this integral that we had before. And now okay. Now we replace this p of theta h t p theta by this um yeah, by this fraction that is done down here, but first we replace this one here by theta. Yeah. So we get this one here, and now it's interesting, you could simply combine these to theta h to the power of, uh, theta to the power of h plus 1. Okay, so far so good. However, this integral is quite a beast, uh, and it very much depends on this probability distribution, whether we can solve this in any way, or whether we can deal with that, right? But since, I mean, this is our prejudice, right? This is not something that we have formally derived. Um, so we have some freedom in choosing this in a convenient way, right? As long as it has this belt shape, um, it's probably fine. It could be a Gaussian, um, could be an upside-down parabola, maybe, so a logistic function, or it could be whatever. So the question is, what is a convenient choice for this so that the whole thing becomes sort of manageable? Now that's the point where the beta distribution comes handy. So the beta distribution is defined as theta to the power of h minus 1 times 1 minus theta to the power of t minus 1 simply normalized, right? This is a proper probability distribution in theta. And here we see quite a similarity. So, right, we have this theta to the power of h something and 1 minus theta to the power of t something. Um, okay, so the denominator is the normalization factor. That's pretty easy to see. And that's called the bitter function. Now, if we 
choose our prior to be just a beta, dis beta distribution. If we set this one here, right, you can already imagine that these go well together. So if we do this, um, we get the following. Right, so I've plugged in the beta function here. And this is the beta function without the denominator, but the denominators cancel out uh, uh, each other, right? Because you have the same beta function here and there, basically, right? Um, and now we can combine the thetas, so the theta h and the theta h minus 1 combines to theta h plus h minus 1, capital H plus lowercase h minus 1, and this combines here from this term and this term, and we have a similar combination further down here. And now if we translate this back, this is simply the beta function for h plus a, capital H plus lowercase h and capital T plus lowercase t, right? So this is normalization, this is a, a beta function, and this is the beta distribution, or oh, this overall, this thing is the beta distribution. So that's very nice. So this is how the theta, uh, theta uh, distribution changes. And now the probability of tossing heads, if we have our prior distribution and we have tossed capital H heads and capital T tails, um, that is given by this equation. Right? So this is again the equation that we had further up. But P theta here is replaced by the beta function. Now we do the very same trick which brought us from here to there, right? So that brings us from here to there. We see these combinations. And now we have this additional one here, right? Plus one here that comes from this theta. Mm -hmm. Good. So this now, and we have an integral, right? We don't have an, a function in theta. We have integrals. So this is really a number. And we can use uh, the beta function to express this, right? If you go up, and look at the definition of the beta function. That's expressed like this. So we just have to to see that the exponent here is something minus one, and then we have to put the something here. This is something minus one here. We put the something there, and then So something minus one, then the something would be capital H lowercase h plus one, right? That would that is this thing, and here the something is capital T plus T here, and here we have this plus one missing. Otherwise, it's the same. Um, okay, so with one, some. Okay, so for the beta distribution, we have this rule. B of h plus one t equals b of h and t times h divided by h plus t. Now, we have this plus 1 here. Yeah? So we can replace this top part by b of capital H plus h, comma, capital T plus t. That is this one here, and these cancel out with each other. Or maybe I, I write this. So with this rule down here, this equals b of first argument minus 1, that would be capital H plus H, and then the second arg argument unchanged, uh, times the first argument minus 1, which would be H plus the capital H plus lowercase h divided by the first argument minus 1 right so so this h plus t is the first argument minus 1 plus the second argument the first argument minus 1 h plus h plus just the second argument uh, so this is this rule here translated to the um, <coughs> numerator. 
And now we see that this term cancels with this term and then we are simply left with capital H plus H divided by capital H plus lowercase h plus capital T plus lowercase t. And this is this thing. Now this is an interesting result because, I mean, let's assume you toss heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, tails for simplicity. Let's assume I've tossed the coin like uh, I've tossed these values here with the coin, and I ask you, okay, what's the probability of getting heads? So one way you could estimate this, if you if you pretend you have no prejudice, you could simply take the number of ages here and divide it by the total number of symbols, right? So from this you might conclude that the probability of age equals. 4 divided by 8, right? Which would be 0.5. So this is a normal way you could do this. But this does not take into account that you actually have a prejudice, right? So if you, if you, um, if I take a coin and I toss 4 times heads and I ask you, okay, what do you think is the probability of that coin to toss heads? I mean, following the same logic as above, you would say, well, P of H is 100%, right? Simply 1. But, I mean, you would not really believe that, right? You would just say, well, bad luck, right? You had four heads, but in, in reality, the coin would also to um, toss um, tails. So you could imagine that you actually have some tosses in mind. Let's say you could pretend, well, probably, I would assume... Uh, that if you would have tossed already a couple of times, I would assume it's a fair coin. So let's assume you would expect something like this. Uh, well, this is uh, what we had above. And then I start really tossing, and I get H, 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 H. And then you would say, okay, there's some evidence that maybe heads is more likely than tails. And internally you could sort of estimate, well, P of H then would be 4 plus 4 divided by 4 plus 0, where the first 4 here represents the heads that you had in mind that might have been tossed before, and the second 4 is the true evidence here. And here the first 4 indicates the 4 t's here, and the 0 indicates the lack of t's. So, you could imagine that your prejudice or your, your prior knowledge about the coin is represented by a number of tosses that have not really been done, but that you pretend have been done. And then you would estimate the probability, um, again, as a ratio of heads divided by the total number of tosses. And that's what this rule does. So and that gives a very nice interpretation to the lowercase h and the lowercase t. It's just a way to represent your prejudice um, about the probability of getting heads. And if you are very certain that is this, that it is a fair coin, maybe you would take hundred heads and hundred uh, tails here in this part. And if you, well, if your if, if your friends are gambling and they come up with a coin, you might have a very mild prejudice here about heads and tails. Okay, so this is a nice formal way to represent the probability for a binary variable and being able to update that as the evidence comes in, right? So you have a way to formalize your prior, your a priori uh, distribution of theta and then add the evidence capital H and, low, uh, and capital T as it comes. Now, um, further up, I've skipped that so far. 
So this image here shows how the distribution, how the beta distribution looks for different values. So this is um, for three different ratios of h to t. So right, one third, one and three. So this this is sort of a fair coin, and this is a biased coin towards tails and this is a biased co coin towards heads and this is a number of total number of tosses here yeah and you see that if you have just a few tosses the distribution is very broad you're very uncertain about the value of theta and as more tosses come in uh, the distribution becomes more and more focus more and more concentrated so that represents that you are more and more certain about the value of theta. But all these distributions are unimodal, right? So they have just one peak. So in cases where you would like to represent multimodal distributions, uh, what you can do is, because this is really convenient to be able to write it like this, right? Uh, so if you have multimodal distributions, you can express it as a combination of different beta distributions. Um, for instance, like this, right? So this would be the your prior defini um, distribution would be 0 0.7 times the beta distribution that represents a fair coin with some certainty, and then uh, there's also maybe you say, well, there's a 30% chance that it is a biased coin, and this represents the distribution of the biased coin. So 70% fair coin, 30% biased coin, and this um, sum then would be a representation of a bimodal distribution. And even though it's getting more, a bit more complicated, this still simplifies uh, the equations above, and you would have sort of sums of, of uh, these uh, expressions like this. OK, so here we have seen how to deal um, with the problem of learning a probability based on uh, data based on the evidence that we get. This is for just a binary variable, but in the next session we look at sort of how to translate this to Bayesian networks.